Okay, so let's proceed with the uh, with the analytical part of um, uh, our day today. Um, we will be talking about the survival analysis and about the clinical data. So um, the disease characterization nowadays include both um, scanning of the whole genome and whole transcriptomes that you've heard so much yesterday about, and the clinical data. These two types of data are actually, um, they, they are needed to be analyzed together as a whole. But at the same time, these data types are intrinsically different. So what is the clinical data? And I will be referring to, uh, to these as uh, clinical variables. So this is a typical example of a clinical data that you can get out of the um, um, published studies. Uh, this was a cancer um, study, um, the paper that we've been um, using throughout the course um, for breast cancer. And so these are different uh, clinical variables here. The ID of the tumor, race, family history, this is the binary data, there is yes or no. Nodal status, again, yes or no, and in some cases, the number of nodes that are involved. Then radiation, was the patient um, uh, treated with radiation, yes or no. Then with the chemotherapy or hormonal therapy. Then uh, if there are some uh, histological um, characterizations of a tumor sample, including some uh, marker uh, protein um, using uh, immunohistochemistry, then staging of a tumor, size of a tumor, it can be age, uh, the diagnosis, and it can be a level of a certain um, markers, in this case it's a hormone levels of, est uh, of uh, progesterone and the estrogen receptor level. Then some other types of um, um, typing, the um, uh, staging and grading of tumor samples. But also, there is a number of clinical variables which have something to do with the time. And that is, for example, the overall outcome, whether the uh, patient is dead or alive at this particular time point, uh, what was the overall survival time, what was the disease-specific uh, survival time, um, and um, other may include something like the recurrent status or the time to the relapse. Uh, so, but basically, uh, distance recurrent status and so on and so forth. So, these variables have something to do with the time. And that's, um, that's called survival time. Uh, these are the times to a given end point. And these um, uh, types, these types of data requires a special analysis, which is called survival analysis. Why it is so, I'm going to explain to you. So um, I just have to mention that we have allocated um, a uh, big slot um, in our workshop uh, for this part. And so the most important thing is for you to understand the basics of a survival analysis, what it's for, and what's behind the statistical approaches of, uh, of this part of statistics so that when you come back to your research, you are able to, to do these simple um, um, uh, analysis yourself. But in order to do them, you really have to understand what's behind them. So uh, you are just welcome to jump in and ask me any questions if you don't understand, because it's really of the paramount uh, importance that you understand every step. So the survival analysis uh, have the, uh, the main goals of a survival analysis are these ones. So for example, uh, can we estimate the probability of an individual surviving for a given time period, say for one year? So say for example you have a, um, a cohort of patients that are of a certain age and they've been treated with a certain drug and you have recorded the survival times and um, outcome, clinical outcome. And then you analyze the data that you have, and using that data, you can predict 
the survival probability of a new patient coming in, right? And so the method which is used for this purpose is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve or a life table. No, not necessarily. No, no, it's just with any disease. Um, now, other goals might be, for, for instance, okay, we have two groups of patients, right? Uh, one patient are treated with a new drug, and then you have a group of, of, of control um, patients who were given some, some standard treatment or were not treated at all. And so you want to uh, answer the question, is this drug really working for these particular patients with this disease with, well, under these conditions? And for that type of goal, we use log rank test, which compares different survival curves, Kaplan-Meier curves. And now there may be other goals such as, um, okay, so what are the risk factors that contribute to a uh, poor prognosis of a patient? Say we have characterized uh, samples using multiple technologies, multiple um, uh, platforms. Um, we have a great number of uh, clinical data for these particular samples. So now, what are the risk factors? And this is a very important question when it comes to the point when uh, a new patient comes in and that patient exhibit a certain pattern of values of those variables. So the expression level of this marker or of that marker, this particular mutation or that particular mutation, age, and it presents a certain um, um, uh, so, and the tumor is of this size and of this grade. So now, what is the prognosis for this patient? How is the patient going um, to do in the future? And that is a very important question in order to choose the appropriate therapy for a given patient. So if uh, the prognosis is poor, then the patient has to be exposed to an aggressive therapy. and. Um, uh, so um, for that type of goals, we use a Cox regression model, and they may be univariate or multivariate Cox regression. That means that univariate is that when you take into account only one variable into your regression model and estimate its effect on survival, or you can test many clinical variables at the same time in the Cox regression model, and that would be called a multivariate regression model. And those different uh, variables would, would be covariates. Clinical, clinical parameters and, and genomic data as well. So it could be genomic data as well. So if you read carefully through um, the Chin paper, if you just have it handy, maybe, I would prompt you to um, look into that paper and find a table where they have um, the, um, the list of the high-level amplicons. which were associated with poor prognosis. Have you found it? What's the number of it? So this is table one, right? So, and it says univariate and multivariate associations for individual applicants and or disease specific survival and distant recurrence. Okay, so within this analysis, so what I told you uh, so far is that our clinical, our variables in the uh, multivariate Cox regression model would be your clinical variables such as these ones, like a nodal status, radiation, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and so on and so forth. So these could be one types of your variables, covariates, in that model. The other types 
of variables could be a genomic aberration. And that's what they've done and summarized in Table 1. So they covariates were all those 11 high-level amplifications. We will be practicing Cox um, regression model using clinical data only, like this one. Because what they've done there is that they've, um, they've basically um, defined those high-level applicants manually. And so um, it is a little hard to do within uh, this time frame that we have. So I'm going to um, let you practice yourself using a clinical variables. And this is most widely um, used uh, variant of this uh, analysis in studies. By manually, it means that they just um, look through the tumors themselves and they defined the extent of those applicants. So it was about two years ago when there was so no they, automatic. They yeah, yes, yeah. And then, and then they try to summarize the um, the overall um, amplification level in some in some you know in some custom way. So um, we just don't have this data in order to put it in into the Cox model here. So we will be using just a um, clinical uh, data that is available for this data set. Yes, in R. Yeah, we will be doing it in R. But um, I would like to um, to have our lab today in slightly different style than yesterday. So um, there are just few methods here, but they have to be used carefully. So you have to really understand what you're doing. And what I will be doing during the lab today is that I will walk you through the whole process. So we will be doing it together. And um, once you understand what you're doing, you will be prompted to uh, perform some simple exercises on your own. So um, this is the survival data. So the survival data, or survival time, is the time from a fixed point to a certain end point. So what could be the end point? The end point is the outcome in our case, and that is a death or recurrence or a relapse. What could be the uh, starting point? The starting point could be surgery, the time of surgery, the time of diagnosis, or for example, the time of treatment. So the intrinsic uh, difficulty with the survival data is that our observations are incomplete, meaning that almost never we observe the event of interest, such as death or occurrence or relapse, in all of our subjects. So by the time that you do the analysis, a portion of patients have reached the endpoint and another portion have not. So those who have not are incomplete observations because the event of interest hasn't occurred. And those observations are called censored observations. And so um, another difficulty with the survival times is that it doesn't follow the, um, doesn't fall into the normal distribution. And so it requires a special analytical techniques, which we are going to cover now. So I'm just going to explain a little bit more what are the censored observations are. So it is a particular endpoint that you choose. Yes. So you can play with the um, with the relapse time. Mm -hmm. 
or the or death. The three of them. No. You have to you have to select your endpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, and very often uh, people just do multiple uh, multiple analysis using different endpoints. Any other questions? So, what are the censored observations? Again, they arise whenever the dependent variable of interest represents the time to a terminal event or to some event of interest, and the duration of the study is limited in time. So again, the censored observations are incomplete observations. So the event of interest did not occur at the time of analysis. So this table shows you a few examples of censored observations from different areas. So in our case, the event of interest is death of the, um, of the disease, and the censored observation is going to be still alive. Now, if our endpoint is the relapse time, what is the censored observation? The patient has not relapsed yet. Yes. Or if our um, endpoint is the uh, distant recurrence of a tumor, what is the censored observation? Okay. That's right. So now, from other uh, areas, survival of marriage, for example. So the marriage didn't survive. They divorced. That's the event of interest. Now the censored observation is going to be, oh, still married. Huh, surprise. <laughs> so now, um, another example is a dropout time from school. Has a child dropped out? No, it's still in school. So the event of interest has not occurred. This is a censored observation. So uh, it is necessary to understand different types of censoring. Uh, the most important ones for our understanding is the type one and type two censoring and right and left censoring. So type one and two censoring uh, refer to a um, either uh, time that is fixed. So, for example, um, um, there is a follow-up of patients, and we decide to terminate the follow-up in the year 2006. Right, and by that time, or 2009, whatever, and by that time, we the time of, of, um, of an analysis is, is fixed and so you just explore what is the proportion of your patients who have reached the endpoint and who have not. So in, with the type 1 censoring, the time of the analysis is the fixed thing and your variable is the proportion of your patients. Now with the type 2 censoring, which is used much, much, much less frequently uh, in our studies, is when the study is conducted up until the point when you have, for example, 50% of your subjects reaching the end point. Any questions? So with, with the tests, you just specify what type of censoring you have. Yes, exactly. That's what usually happens in the of trial. So, so for example, the trial is planned for about five years, right? And then during, say, first one or two years, you recruiting patients, and up to that, you follow them up till the end of the study. So what is the right and left censoring? So this type of censoring refers to the time continuum. And so um, with the right censoring, there is a um, known starting point 
and there is no um, uh, a certain um, endpoint. And this means um, our example that I mentioned to you. So these patients have reached the endpoint, and these ones have not reached the endpoint. So it means that by the time uh, we conduct the uh, analysis, those patients are still alive, and you don't know what's going to be the survival time, right? So that's why it is called the right censoring. Now, um, I want to mention this type of censoring before going to the left censoring, because this one is a part of this. This is called the interval censoring, and this means that the uh, event of interest occurred within the interval of time. Right. So what would be the example of that? So say the death occurred within some period of time. You don't really know where exactly. Or the relapse occurred within some period of time. So when the patient comes in with a relapse disease, you don't really know where exactly the relapse took place, right? Can you measure time? Measure time? Measure time of the treatment of the patient in the study? With this interval? Yeah, with any interval. So if you, you actually, study, so look here, for example. Time. So for example, here, with the left censoring, say, you know the end point, but you don't know the start point. And that is, for example, the start of the disease. So when the patient comes into the clinic, it already manifests some disease, right? But when that disease started, you don't know. And so that is an example of your left censoring. If all the patients you start counting the time, the time of the treatment, not the time of onset of disease, but you don't Yeah, this is what I'm going to talk right now about. Yeah. So, for example, now we're moving to the um, analysis of the survival time and survival probabilities, which is the basis of the Kaplan Meier uh, survival analysis. So, for instance, this is a uh, um, trial with the patient's accrual for the first six months and then following them up up until 18 months in time. So as you can see, all the follow-up time for different patients are completely different, right? And moreover, by the time of the end of study, some of them are dead, black, some of them are still alive. So now, how do you um, infer the survival probability? So the first step that you make is that you order your patients according to the time of the follow-up. And then you divide your time scale into the intervals which contain exactly one case of a complete observation where a patient has reached the um, event of interest, in this case, the deaths, and you are ignoring the censored observation. Okay? So you have divided this time scale into these uh, intervals, and then at every interval, you compute the proportion of those who are dead and of those who are still at risk, who are still alive. And that gives you a probability at every particular interval. So for example, probability of survival month two is the probability of surviving month one multiplied by the probability of surviving month two, provided that the patient has survived month one. So what does it mean? It means that when you compute the probability of a patient surviving month two, the patient had to survive month one. And so this is called a conditional probability because this is conditioned 
for the survival month one. And so um, this is how it's done uh, in Kaplan-Meier survival estimator. So the survival probability is just a geometric sum or multiplication of all of those conditional probabilities at every time interval. And every time interval, again, is um, um, contains exactly one case of a complete observation. So the um, survival probability, actually, can be represented um, with a table. And in that case, it's going to be a life table analysis. And graphically, it can be represented by a Kaplan-Meier curve. So this is, again, your uh, probability of survival, which comes from this formula. It is just more mathematical. Um, um, syntax, geometric sum of these proportions, R are still at risk patients, and F are those who are uh, failures, or patients who have reached the end point. And so this is your survival probability function. And this is a step function, because you have your um, probabilities only when you have a certain, um, uh, when you have uh, your event of interest. So once the patient dies, you have a drop. The next patient dies, you have a drop again. Okay, so what it tells you, for example, you have two survival curves here, for one group of patients, for another group of patients. So this is your time scale. And this is your probability of survival. So it tells you that over time, the survival of your patients from both groups is actually declining, the survival probability. And uh, it's, it's declining more rapidly within this group than with this, than this group. So now let me ask you this question. Uh, if you have a patient coming in to the clinic and you know that this patient is under the same conditions as the patients who have been used to construct this Kaplan-Meier curve. So what is the probability of that patient surviving two and a half months? 50%. That's right. So that's how you interpret those curves. Now, let's say these are the patients who were not treated with a drug. Now let's see, what if we treat this patient with a drug? Do we increase the probability of uh, his or her survival two and a half months? Yes, the probability really increases. So that's how we interpret those curves, like this. I'm, I'm sorry? The center? Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I didn't mention that. That you see vertical tick marks? These indicate censored observations. So if you look into this formula, these are the number of patients at a given time interval who are still at risk, who have not died, right? But, um, but if you have censored observations, right, which happened before that time interval, then you just, you remove them from this. So that's how it is uh, accounted by the censored observations. And that's how you get those vertical tick marks. Sure. So, for instance, you have a uh, these two curves, and you plot the Kaplan-Meier curve, and you see that they, you know, they separate. So, and now the question is, um, is it really worthy 
to put this drug into the clinic? Is it really effective for these patients? Well, yeah, two curves actually separate. Well, let's go ahead and do it. So, but now the question is, are these survival experiences are actually statistically significant? And we use another test to answer this question. So this is more for a um, estimation of a probability of how the patient uh, will do in time under given conditions and uh, for just the visual um, um, examination, initial examination of uh, different survival experiences of different groups of patients. So now, what is the test for that? Yeah, so, uh, but in any case, this is sort of an estimate. This is an estimator that has been fitted using the data from your cohort. And uh, where you see the number of patients, that's good. If, if there's more number of patients, that's good, right? But you all, always want to, to refer to the next test, which is a low grant test, in order to say, okay, whether it is really statistically significant. So you can let's get the number of patients in each group, meaning in the red in the red line where you can add every drop and every line is not patient, right? And the same as with the green. So you can see that there are a bunch of patients in the green and in the blue line and a much lesser number of patients in the left line, in the red line, right? Mm -hmm. That's that yeah. So I can count yeah. the number of patients by yeah. the number of vertical drops and the yeah. number of so, vertical peaks, right? Yeah. Peaks. Yeah. You see, okay. there is a multiple drop yeah. there. Okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. So now the low rank yeah. test. This is a non-parametric method to test the null hypothesis that compared groups are samples from the same population with regard to survival experience. So the survival time does not follow the normal distribution, so we need a non-parametric method. And you can think of doing some similar, uh, some simple analysis, such as comparison of a median survival times in two groups, but it's not that adequate because you are looking just at the um, average picture, whereas you have different time intervals, right? So, and um, that's what the log rank test for. It tells you whether two survival experiences are statistically significant, but at the same time doesn't tell you how different. And there are other tests that I briefly mentioned that serve that purpose. So now, how is this uh, Lograng test uh, performed? So you have two groups of patients, and then you uh, divide your time scale again. So again, you divide the, uh, your time scale into the intervals. And then you test the significance of, of difference for every individual interval separately. And then you sum up. Then you summarize. And that's going to be the overall statistics. OK, so now how do you define your intervals? So I'm going to tell you. So um, the intervals that you're going to have contain. Um, so they happen only when you have your um, event of interest. So you ignore your censored observations, but you take all of the complete observations from both groups you merge them. So for instance, here, this is time interval, and this is the next interval. But there are many more intervals from that group in between, so you include them. So you merge them, right? So that's how you get your intervals for the log rank test. And then for every interval, what you do is you just compare your proportions of patients at every interval. 
which is similar to the chi-square statistics, um, two by two tables. And then you just summarize it across all the time intervals. So this is the, um, the basic formula for the chi-square test, where you have basically your observed um, uh, variable, I mean, um, uh, your observed measurement and expected value. And the chi-square test um, gives you this estimate. So how, um, uh, how different two proportions are. This is the essence of a chi-square test. Okay? So, and the log-ring test is similar to that, with one exception that here you have not an expected value, but this variance of this expression. And so, similarly with the chi-square test, uh, you get the statistics, and what you do is that you just compare with the chi-square distribution with the chi minus 1 degrees of freedom, where chi, k, I'm sorry, is a number of your intervals. To what curves? Oh, I see. So, um, so, um, oh, hello. <laughs> What's wrong with this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, the, uh, this is the essence of a chi-square test. So when you compare two proportions. And so uh, you have two by two table where you have one group and another group. And you have a, a, a proportion of your events in one group and proportion in your, um, of your events in another group. Right, so for example, in one column you have um, group one Another column is group two. And now you have your event of interest, death. So within group two, you have eight patients dead, 15 alive. Thank you. And in the second column, you have, say, 15 patients dead and three alive, right? So actually, these actual numbers are your observed measurements in the chi-square. Now, um, what you do then next is that you can calculate a proportion in each group of patients dead, right? You just sum up the column. This is the number of your patients in your group. And then you take a fraction of those who are dead. And then you compare these proportions. So now the expected values actually come from a sum of columns and rows of this two by two table. These are your expected values. And this is the essence of a chi-square test. And so it is similar for the log rank test. So when you get the statistics, then again, you compare with the chi-square distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom and you get your p-value for that one. So now, the log test, as I told you, um, tells you whether two survival experiences are statistically significant. But at the same time, it doesn't really tell you how much different. So, and here's the very simple measure um, that gives you this extent of uh, differences between two groups. This is called a hazard ratio and it measures a relative survival in two groups based on the complete period studied. So it is very rough estimate, but at the same time, it gives you the overall picture. So for example, what is the um, hazard ratio of 0.43? And you compare group one to group two. It tells you that the relative risk or hazard of poor outcome under the condition of group one is 43% of that of group two. 
So group two is definitely doing worse than group one. Yeah. So now, um, we're moving to the Cox proportional hazard model, which is a slightly complicated uh, topic. And I will try to explain as much as I can so that you understand um, what it is and how to interpret the results of this test. So it is used to investigate the effect of several variables on survival experience. And um, it is a multivariate proportional hazards regression model with a number of different variables taken into account, which are called covariates. So this is a formula for the hazard function as a function of time, which is some baseline hazard multiplied by the exponential of this term. So what is this term? This is a sum of all your independent variables of interest, such as size of a tumor, stage of a tumor, nodal status, chemotherapy, um, okay, protein level, for that matter, right? And these are the regression coefficients for those variables, which are to be estimated by the model. So, so you have a number of your covariates, clinical variables, and you want to explore the effect onto the survival of a patient. And so those variables come together here, and you get, as a result, you get these coefficients that you will need to interpret. So, and this is a hazard function, right? Um, the hazard model, the hazard regression model, has one assumption, that the effect of your variables is constant over time and additive in particular scale. That's the assumption. So it is additive and it's constant over time. So um, now, similarly to a Kaplan-Meier, Hazard function actually gives you a risk of dying after a given time, assuming survival thus far, right? So far, I've been talking about the survival probability. So the survival probability would be this, with the exponential of the minus of the hazard. So, and you can actually construct the same survival curves using the survival probability that comes out from this uh, regression model. And we will be practicing that too in our lab. So um, again, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, just a couple more uh, points that I wanted to emphasize is that it is a cumulative function. So what it means is that over time, the risk of dying is increasing with this particular set of variables or that particular set of variables, right? Uh, and so, again, as with the Kaplan-Meier curve, what's uh, the immediate outcome of, of this thing is that for an individual that comes in with a particular set of values of your variables, you should be able to estimate its um, patient survival um, using this Cox model. How do you count the patient's uh, loss of sleep because of other reasons like dying or an accident or, or uh, being bugged or so on? Well, uh, these should be censored observations. So one of the, uh, one of the um, examples of censored observation is that the patient actually falls out of study for some reason. For example, he moves or he dies of some accident. That is a censored observation. Yeah. So now it is very important now to understand how do we interpret 
the results of a Cox regression model. So this is a very simple example that I took from this book that I personally really love. This is Medical Statistics uh, for Clinical Research by um, Dan Altman. So um, this was from the PBC trial of um, uh, comparison the patient's outcome using this drug versus placebo. This was the number of patients. And so these were the clinical variables that, uh, that were read out from the patients. And this is the result of a Cox regression model the multivariate regression model using all of these variables. So as I said, the outcome of the regression model are the coefficients and the, uh, the, um, the p-values of whether, yeah, I'll mention it later right now, um, right? So here what you see is that they would usually give you a, a regression coefficient itself, then the standard error of the coefficient, and then the exponential of the coefficient. How do we interpret it? So two important points. When you look at the coefficient, you look for a sign, whether it is positive or negative sign. So the positive sign means that the higher value of this variable, the more risk you have of dying. The negative sign means the higher values you have for this variable, the less risk you have. Now, can you estimate how much less, how much more from this table? Yes. So if you look, um, now you can look at the magnitude of this, and then more specifically at the magnitude of this exponential of this coefficient. So if you, trans if you take two time points and put it into the formula that I gave you before for the hazard, cumulative hazard, and if you take the ratio of two time points, then your baseline uh, hazard is going to go, right? And you will end up with this expression, right? So now, the magnitude now of the exponential of this coefficient right there refers to the increase in your hazard if you increase your variable by one. And this is times of the original hazard. So for instance, here for example, you see that this one shows negative coefficient and the exponential translated to the 0.95 and this means that the increase of the level in serum albumin by one is going to result in a 95% uh, in the hazard 95% of that one of the first one I mean so this means 5% decrease in risk okay and other example here for instance with um, if a patient receives a therapy this is a coefficient this is the exponential, and so this actually already in increase um, by one because it's a binary data. The patient either has therapy and then the code is one, or doesn't have a therapy and then the code is zero. So for this uh, dehotomous data, it's pretty simple. So if you have a therapy for that patient, then, uh, I mean, if you don't have a patient, uh, oh, I'm sorry, if you, um, let's see, uh, if you have a therapy for that, then, um, I mean, if you don't have a therapy, then you increase your risk by 168% compared to when you don't have therapy. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes. So the negative means that it is a favorable factor so for the so poor the outcome. The difference between what you have in the, in the, the XP yeah. and what another. Yeah. So so this is this is a hazard of a poor outcome. Okay, and so now if um, if you have this hazard function estimated and then you transform it to the survival probability, then you get a formula like this where you have this term which is frequently referred to as a prognostic index, which means that um, you can estimate the prognostic index for a given patient with a given values of your variables. And then having uh, the survival probability, you can plot it, and it's going to be the same step function as in kaplan meier and the same representation. So these are patients treated with a drug, and these are um, um, having a placebo. Okay. So now, um, what have we learned from this part? So... Clinical data is a highly important component of uh, our studies and is intrinsically different from genomic and transcriptomic data. Then survival data is a special type of data which requires special methodology, which we've covered. And main applications of survival analysis are the following estimate the survival probability of a patient for a given length of time, and we use Kaplan-Meier survival curves or light tables for that. Uh, then we want to compare the survival experiences of different group of patients, and we use log rank tests there. This is um, commonly used to answer the question, is the drug working? And then uh, we may investigate multiple uh, risk factors that might contribute to the um, survival experience of a patient in order to make a prognosis for a new patient uh, with a given set of um, clinical variables and to choose an appropriate therapy. Okay, so now um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. 